the paradigm that you own your identity, that everything sort of lives in your crypto wallet and can be carried from place to place is incredibly powerful, right? Like so much of our Web2 online activity is a form of identity, right? We're, you know, we're posting photos on Facebook and Instagram. We're updating profiles on LinkedIn. We're sort of creating all of these, you know, receptacles of identity. Um, but we don't, but first of all, they only live in the, the frame of the platform they're in. We don't have a way to sort of like turn them into a more abstract and sort of complete representation of ourselves. Um, and also they're very siloed, right? You, you can't sort of, you know, there, there are integrations, there are plugins and things that let you sort of, you know, use your LinkedIn information to pre-fill some form or something of the sort, but you don't have the ability to sort of really control that identity itself. You're listening to the Unstoppable Podcast, the go-to place for everyone to learn about the latest innovations in Web3, NFTs, and the decentralized web. Welcome to the Metaverse. GM, GM, welcome to the Unstoppable Podcast. My name is Josh Gordon. I'm your host. Today, we've got a special guest, Scott. He's a Harvard Business School professor and part of the research team at A16Z Crypto. So we, Scott, you and me got a chance to connect on a Twitter space about a month ago. And I thought it was a fantastic conversation about reputation and identity. And as the market is kind of shifting now from being so price focused, and as we he head into the bear market and we focus a lot on building and research and fleshing out some of the ideas that people have gotten excited about, I think that this topic is one that's gonna get a lot of attention over the coming years. So I'm excited to dive into it with you. Thanks so much. It was great to chat about a month ago and, and it's great to be back. And I agree. You know, I think, you know, we're going to see really interesting applications develop out of the current cycle and, you know, reputation and on-chain identity is going to be, uh, you know, a first order category. For sure. So can you walk us through how you got into crypto and what led you to thinking about and researching about this identity and reputation layer uh, of Web3? Cool. So I, I won't tell the whole story of how I got into crypto, but the short form is I'm a you know market design professor. I study the design of markets and marketplaces, and especially new types of market clearing algorithms and technologies that can help organize and, and create new transactions. Um, and so, naturally, you know, crypto is heavily in that category, and I've been following it for for a very long time. But I was actually originally on record as a, a pretty serious skeptic, um, and it took. You know, lots and lots of talking with collaborators who were who were more uh, you know sort of bullish than I was, and sort of watching waves of applications emerge um, before I really got excited. And the first sort of big crypto project I was involved in, my my friend and, and frequent collaborator Christian Catalini, uh, you know, was the it was you know sort of serving as chief economist for uh, for Diem the you know the the Diem slash originally Libra project, um, and. One of my students and I worked with him on sort of thinking through a lot of the, the core research questions that, you know, you, you have to understand in order to try and think about how you build a, you know, a, a decent, you know, partially decentralized transaction layer sort of to, to act as large scale transaction infrastructure. Uh, and in that period, I also got really interested in a lot of these sort of broader crypto application space. Um, and then more recently, I uh, got very excited about NFTs and consumer crypto applications, in large part because these applications, unlike sort of a lot of the, the cryptocurrencies or, or even sort of some of the broader finance applications, you know, these come with immediate consumer use cases. Um, and indeed, uh, NFT projects, you know, you can sort of start from a very small community of, of enthusiasts and, you know, grow outwards, right? You're sort of that small community can, can grow a lot of attention and engagement uh, that then draws more people in and gets them to be excited. And that's very different from, you know, an application like a cryptocurrency where, you know, a currency is only useful as a medium of exchange once a very large number of people are willing to accept it. Um, and so, you know, sort of a lot of consumer crypto applications gain use value immediately. Whereas, you know, sort of a yeah. lot of the, the finance applications sort of only have, as, you know, sort of the same type of use value once they reach scale. Um, and then reputation specifically is just, is another category, right? Once you 
once you have consumers engaging with crypto and like using their crypto wallets as you know ways of storing bits of you know sort of their their online persona, whether it's NFTs they've collected or or a URL like a you know like an ENS or an unstoppable domain, um, uh, or you know their history of participation in a DAO or some other organization, right? All of these together, you know, form a, a type of identity, and I. I you know, was was first introduced to this topic formally by one of my you know former students, uh, Jad Esber, who's now a uh, you know a, a crypto entrepreneur. Uh, he co-founded a company called Kudos, which is like a, a Web three Pinterest. And I should footnote disclose I'm an advisor to the company, so we're we're, we're frequent co-authors, and we also talk uh, you know talk work sometimes. Um, the uh, and what he sort of is trying to understand is like, how are people going to create their, you know, sort of turn all of this unstructured interaction they're having on the internet into a form of identity that they can carry with them. And what he sort of introduced me to is this idea that the, the paradigm that you own your identity, that everything sort of lives in your crypto wallet and can be carried from place to place is incredibly powerful, right? Like so much of our web two online activity is a form of identity, right? We're, you know, we're posting photos on Facebook and Instagram. We're updating profiles on LinkedIn. We're sort of creating all of these, you know, receptacles of identity. Um, but we don't, but first of all, they only live in the, the frame of the platform they're in. We don't have a way to sort of like turn them into a more abstract and sort of complete representation of ourselves. Um, and also they're very siloed, right? You You can't sort of, you know, there, there are integrations, there are plugins and things that let you sort of, you know, use your LinkedIn information to pre-fill some form or something of the sort, but you don't have the ability to sort of really control that identity itself. Yeah. 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 I, uh, a, a lot to respond to there. You know, one is the articles that you wrote with Jad were something that I found super insightful on the topic of repu reputation identity. We'll definitely be sure to link those because it spawned a bunch of questions, some of which I want to ask you today. So thanks for putting that together. And then your your comment about Web2 identity and reputation being siloed. I, I kind of want to add a a clarification point on that because I feel like the the word silo it makes so much sense to me coming from like a computer information systems background and for people who may not have experience with like database design or something I want to kind of say that every internet company we interact with basically has a database and you can think of that database sitting on its own right and then there's every website is its own database and so we say the our data is siloed they're they're disconnected between all those companies, all those databases and systems. And so um, in, in a Web2 world where they're disconnected, we talk about in Web3 how those databases can now talk to each other in open and accessible ways. So exactly. is, am, I, am I capturing that right when you talk 100%. about Web2 being siloed and, and the that difference in Web3? 100%. And and this is a really important point for you know platform competition too. Uh, Christian and I wrote a piece about this for um, uh, CPI Tech Reg Chronicle. Um, when you think about what portable identity means for platform competition, right? Or, or you know, and, and portable identity, portable like assets. The fact that I hold all of my NFTs in a in a crypto wallet that I can point any individual trading platform to means that if a new trading platform comes along that you know sort of is offering more rewards or lower prices or whatever people can just switch over if they want they just you know take their crypto wallet and point the new platform to it um, you know and, and that's precisely what happened in the context of looks rare right you know when they they launched yeah. through what's called a vampire attack they provided direct incentives to try and get people to switch over um, and they were able to use the fact that these databases are public Right. They could, you know, use the fact that they could see who had made a lot of open sea transactions and directly offer them incentives. Uh, you know, you have a reputation, if you will, for being a, a big trader in NFTs and looks where can say, great, we're going to reward you in particular if you join our platform. And then the actual act of switching platforms is as simple as connecting your wallet to a different site. Um, yeah. Similarly, like let's let's imagine that in the context of something like social media, um, you know, in the Web2 world. 
you can't just sort of take your your content out of Facebook or or out of uh, you know sort of Twitter or something of the sort. You you actually can typically export it, right? These platforms give an export option, but it's sort of in a very disor- you know sort of like proprietary organization um, that doesn't and it, and and you can take a lot of your data, the things you've created, but you often can't take you know platform assets or or platform generated data from your interactions. Um, Whereas often a lot of that actually does live on chain in Web three as well, um, but so you can you can take these assets off of a Web two platform by exporting them, but there's no way to like use that. It's not in a standardized format that you can just bring to some other platform and have that platform then plug into and use. Whereas again in Web three, because everything lives on these interoperable standards, interoperable meaning you know, sort of the same digital asset can be used sort of across platforms. They all sort of agree to like plug into the same type of infrastructure or, or same, you know, sort of category of infrastructure. Um, mm-hmm. It really is possible to like, you know, to take your assets and use them in lots of different ways, right? You can have an NFT in your wallet that you, you know, you point your Twitter profile image to, and then you also like point some online gallery to, and you also use as like a, you know, a projected metaverse wearable in Decentraland or something like that. And that's very powerful, right? You have this one digital asset, which you yourself own and can simultaneously and seamlessly sort of port into all of these different platforms because they're all working on a single standard. For sure. This is, this is a concept that conceptually is sometimes feels simple but is also like massive at the same time and i don't know how to like articulate that necessarily but the the concept of being able to take your assets with you from platform to platform is a huge change up of how things are done but maybe it's just because you know in the scheme of history this internet age we've experienced so far is just the smallest blip on the radar and Mm -hmm. how we're actually interacting with the internet we, I think a lot of times we just accept for it, this is how it's done. Whereas at the, I feel like we're just in the early phases of figuring out how to potentially do it, right? And so mm-hmm. the, because we've been interacting for the last 10 years of, oh, every website I go to, every social platform like Instagram, Instagram's kind of known as the highlight reel of social media apps, right? And I can't take those photos with me those highlights, those moments with me to the next platform I go to and retain all that engagement, commentary, captions. Um, And so you lose that. But if they were NFTs that I owned, I could take that with me as part of my digital identity. And exactly. uh, And I I don't think that that's connecting with the the widespread, you know, population just yet. People aren't quite realizing why that's important. So I'm kind of well, curious, it's... you said you were, and if you want to respond to that, please do. But on, on top of it is, you said you were like a skeptic. And I, I want to know what was, was there like one inflection point, like one hmm. concept or idea, um, or maybe an application that really made you go, oh, like this is important. And I do see how this is going to literally affect every industry and how we interact on the internet. Yeah. All right. So two. So I'll I'll get to that question in a second. Let me just quickly comment on this. You mentioned that the you know sort of the average you know internet user doesn't yet see the the benefits to being able to own and, and transport your assets. I mean, I think that's you know it's a very new idea that one could even own a digital asset, right? Like, you know, the widespread confusion about what these digital assets are comes from a very genuine place, which is that. Previously, there just wasn't such a thing, right? It's not like we, you know, had some other really good way of keeping track of, of ownership of digital images or, um, you know, or, or, or song, you know, sort of instances of, of song recordings or something of the sort. Uh, there's a fundamentally new technology here, um, but at some level, it's a technology that's also very old, right? Like the idea of creating a deed, you know, uh, it's something we've done, you know, for for generations. Um, Except historically, we've done this through centralized trusted institutions, right? You have a registry of deeds that keeps track of the changing of title of in land or something of the sort. And here, what's special is that the the blockchains, but you know, sort of serve as a you know a public infrastructure layer that keeps track of all of these transactions and, and changes of ownership, and and also is sort of many of the rights that ownership entails. Um, the other, and then, but you know, as we start to see this changing platform dynamics, 
I actually think it creates a lot of, com or it will hopefully create a lot of competitive pressure, right? When you know that your users can just leave, take all their assets with them. And, and as you said, not just their, you know, their, their assets of like, here's an image I uploaded, because that you, you could own the image, you could take the image somewhere else, but also your engagement, your sort of like history of, of you know, content and communi you know, sort of content communications and chat and so forth. If you could take all of that with you and just plug it into some new platform. Uh, the platform you're on has to really build, you know, sort of community cohesion and engagement, right? It has to make users want to use it rather than a competitor, which is very different yeah. from sort of the previous iteration of platform competition that we've been we've been living in, and, and in, in most industries we still are, uh, where you know competition is you know sort of platform uh, strategy is is about trapping users, getting, you know, sort of using network effects and, and, you know, especially built around data and sort of like, you know, optimized algorithms to make it suboptimal for anyone to ever leave a platform, which means that the platform has all the market power. Um, and so I think there really is a sense in which as people start to come into the idea of digital ownership and, and this portability of your digital assets that follows from it, We'll, we'll hopefully see more competition in, in large scale tech platforms. Um, but now, yeah. okay, so this question of, and, and indeed, and, and like from somebody who's like background is as a, you know, a classically trained economist, right? Um, that's exceedingly exciting, right? I, um, I guess I was first becoming exposed to economics just as the early literature on the economics of internet platforms was really taking off. Um, you know, those papers were, you know, 2003 through 2009, and I was, you know, starting to study economics in 2007. And so watching the possibility of a, of a transformation in the competitive landscape in, you know, in tech platforms is, I think, something that's like just completely extraordinary. Uh, but that wasn't the original aha. The, the original aha was actually this DM application that uh, Christian sort of convinced me of the idea, and again, it doesn't have to be DM specifically, but the, the concept is that there should be a backbone transaction infrastructure layer for the internet. Just like we have all of these, um, you know, sort of servers basically distributed around the world that are that store and, and propagate the internet, there should be a, a similarly robust and, and similarly powerful, like, you know, sort of semi-decentralized layer that you can use for transactions. And the, you know, the interesting thing about that, so what I was skeptical about in so many of these early crypto applications was that they seem to be introducing decentralization for the sake of decentralization. And like to an economist, that doesn't really make very much sense, right? Like decentralization is really costly. Right. And, and we know this, you know, if you don't have some sort of centralized institution, then instead you end up using, you know, maybe some proof of work system that's extremely slow and like very energy intensive. You know, it, it's costly. It's For not sure. free. And so if your application doesn't need decentralization, you know, yes, you can do it. It's a, it's a technically feasible thing, but it's not compelling from a from an economic perspective because the costs are greater than the benefits. But this idea of like, a global transaction infrastructure layer, and, and especially one that you could run smart contracts on top of, I think is extraordinarily compelling, both because of this, you know, sort of public infrastructure, like interoperability, like feature, which in and of itself is, is, a, is a major public good. But on top of that, you know, sort of, there are all of these places that don't have secure transaction institutions. And so the potential for financial inclusion by basically extrapolating from the places with the institutions from the places with strong institutions to the places with weaker ones, you know, is, is extraordinary, right? You could, you know, create a way for small businesses in places that don't have sort of secure currency regimes or, or sort of strong banking institutions to leverage this like global transaction layer that would be as hard to bring down as the internet. Yeah. Um, it makes and like, me, I, I took... I, uh, I'm no Harvard economist, but I, uh, I remember one of these econ classes I took in my undergrad and read the book, Why Nations Fail. And mm -hmm. a lot of it was talking about how it took 
you know, two examples that were or two kind of nations very close to each other and how oftentimes it was the infrastructure embedded yep. within that society that led to its economic success or downfall. And what I hear you describing is a global standard, a global infrastructure that everybody can tap exactly. into and rely on. And it starts giving opportunities um, that are a little bit less like ge geographically dependent or politically dependent and just opens up opportunity for all. Yeah, um, exactly. And that was sort of, you know, and, and that was sort of both simultaneously like an incredibly compelling vision for public good and an incredibly compelling vision for this specific type of technology. And so that, you know, to the extent that there was like an eye opening moment, I, th I think that was it. Um, cool. Yeah, I, I appreciate that breakdown. Um, I, I find it just curious what everyone's aha moments are, what their inflection points are, because for people who are believers in Web3, I, that moment comes. Um, mm -hmm. There's a moment where things start clicking. I'm still working on, on my parents on that one, but uh, <laughs> a lot of my friends, I've seen it happen, and uh, luckily I get to chat with people like you who have had it. But let's, let's dive into identity and reputation a little deeper now. Um, since I, I think you have some really good ways of thinking around on-chain identity. And let me quickly, right, right before we go there, just, just off that last comment, let me, let me very quickly yeah. give a shout out to my parents who've been incredibly supportive of all of this. Uh, and my mom who nice. now, when like she sees some announcement of something like, you know, goes and like looks up the ENS and is like, you know, hey, <laughs> you know, has anybody registered this ENS yet? Um, so yeah. uh, <laughs> anyhow, sorry. All, Shout outs to all parents. Right. Well, we got to get her. We got to get her to uh, look and start registering some unstoppable domains too, because then she'll own it forever. So that's like, I mean, that's part of part of this conversation. Is there's a lot of people experimenting, and it's okay for like different competitors to experiment on the same thing, right? And mm. you talk about, I don't know, some of the things you were mentioning earlier as you were walking through some things that excited you. One thing that excites me about NFTs and crypto is like this idea of ownership and the ability, to, like with NFTs, you can own digital assets, own digital property for the first time. And it opens up a whole world of uh, new innovations on top of that. And like with Unstoppable Domains, being able to own your Web3 identity, like it starts off with simplifying crypto payments, but then it just goes into a whole world of like identity and reputation. And I think we're yeah. we're thinking about it in a certain way and i think that you're thinking about it in a similar way so that's totally. really why i wanted to to chat with you so for to maybe just to start off at a high level like what does on-chain reputation mean to you great question um so to me there's sort of the there's the unprocessed reputation and there's the processed reputation right what's particularly powerful about the way blockchains work in terms of establishing a, you know, a reputation and an identity for a person is that the history of all the transactions, even sort of micro transactions like interactions with a, you know, with a, you know, with an application or, or you know, votes in, in some sort of on-chain uh, governance process, all of these things are, are stored, right? They become part of the under, you know, sort of the underlying data. And this doesn't just have to be the categories of data we're collecting now, but you can imagine all sorts of contexts where things that are currently in Web 2 digital exhaust. Um, you know, like, you know, you create a PowerPoint at, you know, your summer internship and that PowerPoint goes around the office and maybe the CEO opens it 20 times. You know, that's actually kind of interesting and useful value, right? That your PowerPoint that you made at your internship is being used sort of continually by the firm even after you leave. But like that data doesn't live anywhere because nothing's collecting it, nothing's tracking it, much less like somehow propagating it and linking it back to you. If the PowerPoint sort of had a digital asset echo that lived in your crypto wallet, right? That you had, inter you had interacted with whatever system it was generated in and, and this, you know, asset as it moved around the firm, you know, was sort of propagating back some high level summary statistic of how valuable it was, right? Like, so, you know, you, you can imagine implementation, like you have an NFT of like a little, um, you know, folder icon or something that gradually turns gold from, from being like, you know, sort of some other color. Uh, by the way, I, 
am not at all good at like coming up with good design ideas off the top of my head. I am certain that is skeuomorphic <laughs> and really ugly, but it is maybe what like you know a, an office application would come up with. So, um, yeah, I think you know, all you the designers this... listening to this right now just <laughs> force quit the application and uh, to stop listening to the podcast of that idea. <laughs> yes, designers, please please stay it. with us. Don't don't uh, don't fault me for my really bad design sensibilities. Um, but uh, you know, I spent a lot of time using Office products. Um, but uh, what was I going to say? No, you know what it should be is it should be like a little paperclip with like googly eyes that like you know gradually turns gold or something like that. That would be like a great throwback. Um, yep. You know, and um, but uh, digital exhaust. Oh yeah, right. So you have this digital exhaust, right? You have this this echo of the value you've created at the firm that now lives in your in your chain, you know, on chain history. And all of these different things together, right? Whether it's that you were in some NFT project or DAO before it got big, or that you like created this PowerPoint that's somehow generating a lot of value at the firm even long after you left. Like these things sort of live in the history of your transactions and online engagements. And that contains a lot of really valuable information about you, right? Like, you know, you can claim you were you were in a club before it got cool. Uh, you can claim that in, and you know, and, and verify it to, to you know the, more to the point. You can verify that you contributed to some large scale open source project, and you can contri- you know verify that this thing you created at your firm is you know remains very valuable to the firm to this day. And so that's sort of the unprocessed, right? There's this, this massive history, like sort of you know jumble of data, digital exhaust of all forms, you know, you're buying and selling NFTs, contributing to DAOs, uh, making PowerPoints, maybe receiving a degree somewhere along the way. Um, I think there will be sort of processed frames for that, both like algorithmic aggregators that sort of make sense of the information and also, you know, sort of showcases where you you yourself sort of like create like a digital resume and and, you know, sort of explain some of the information yourself or lay it out how you would like. But it's a combination yeah. of that, that tracking and, and permanence and immutability, right? The sort of the fact that all the information is there and, and accessible both to these types of applications that might aggregate it to third parties who might want to like, you know, hire you or create, you know, sort of a, you know, a bio about you for a, for a talk or something. And also to you to be able to showcase in, in a way that's completely verifiable. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> I was listening to this podcast recently and they were, the, the hosts were talking about this guy who, was track he tracked like every data point he could f- about himself for like eight years and you That's could cool. go through this website he made and it was like on every single day tracked i think it was like 800 different data points everything from body temperature sleep mood i mean how much time spent on the internet like did i talk to a friend today like all that kind of stuff and then at the end of it uh at the end of the study said on the website you know, after doing all this research, I've concluded that tracking all this information yielded no benefit to me. Uh, while it was interesting, though, and you talk about, I think something I'm trying to figure out is what pieces of our digital exhaust or our online identity do we want to be tracking around reputation and associated with ourselves? You know, is is every single document we create and share actually worthy? Or am I hearing from you that there are going to be aggregators who track the granular data points, like the transaction histories and the things you create, how many times they're viewed? Like, there's going to be uh, there's going to be area and innovation around that, but then there's also going to be innovation around the data points that you choose to display mm-hmm. associated with your identity. Like, will there be those two worlds or do we really yeah, need exactly. all I think that we, digital information tracked? Yeah, well, and and the do you track everything? What do you track? That's also a very hard question, right? There will be, you know, because clearly we don't want to store everything on chain, uh, you know, and nor can we at current levels of the architecture, right? Like, could you imagine, um, you know, if every single interact, you know, if every single key press or something on your computer, like, also created some sort of on chain transaction? Um, you know, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the gas wars of yesteryear would be nothing in comparison to the sort of absurd levels of transaction processing necessary. So, so yeah. definitely there's like a, there's a, a deep question about like what types of information is useful 
and and how do you record that in ways that are robust and and but you know and meaningful but also not gigantic right like you're not going to store you know you're hopefully not going to store the entire powerpoint uh you know for example um at least you know again with sort of current architecture um then yeah. there are these two curation questions right there will be sort of like you know you know, algorithmic curator, you know, curation applications that sort of like organize the information by looking at all of it and, and sort of using algorithms to process and, and simplify it and sort of pick out useful bits. Uh, and then there'll be sort of personal curation. There's also sort of the underlying question of like, you know, who has access to what, right? In a world where, you know, and, and again, in a world where things are immutable, especially, you have to be very careful about which types of things you store and like how much you know, sort of like the opposite of the ability, you know, sort of the, a lot of the movements around being able to forget stuff from your digital history. It's already, you know, we already have on the internet, lots of, you know, instances where there's actually more information that, that, that people would like to be able to remove. Um, yeah. And so figuring out how we, we like, what a, what a proper process for, you know, curating who has access to what types of information, what, if anything, you know, sort of, does really become completely immutable and permanent. Like these are all questions I think innovation is also going to have to address. Uh, you know. Yeah, you, you know, with the so at, at Unstoppable we rolled out. We we talked about this on our Twitter space. We rolled out badges, and yes. I think that was an interesting example of curation because it, we looked at certain smart contracts and looked to see if people had engaged with them. Right, their their yep. transaction. You can see their someone's wallet that they've associated with their domain that you can then look at that wallet and see what its transaction history has um, has been. And so for certain transactions, like minting a certain NFT, holding an NFT, um, we're able to self-create badges. And that these badges, uh, members can go in and select if they want to display these on their profile or hide them. And so it's it's a very, I'd say, first, um, first iteration attempt at some of this mm -hmm. like self curation of reputation and then allowing people to choose what they hide and, and don't hide, you know, their transaction history is out there at yep. the same time, the average person has no ability to actually sift through that transaction history and make sense of that data. Um, so it's, I think it'll be interesting to see how other people then tap in and choose to create badges, uh, you know, eventually open source this, this functionality, allow third parties to create badges. Then as a user, I can choose what I want to display or mm -hmm. keep hidden. Um, but yeah, it, it exactly. definitely allows other people to start creating different identity points. Um, yeah, very much. I mean, and, and, and let me just, you know, shout out quickly. I, I said this on the, the Twitter space as well. You know, I, I think the, you know, sort of the, the toggle on, toggle off, you know, sort of display system that you guys are, are working with is very much like one paradigm that, that works here, right? That like, you know, just like somebody could read through like every post one ever made on Facebook or something like that, you know, you can choose ones to curate and sort of like elevate or, or, or pin or whatever the case. I actually don't remember whether Facebook specifically has pinning. We can call it, you know, Slack definitely does. So does Discord. Um, the uh, Facebook definitely has some way of like choosing photos as their as your um, sort of main view fo photos. I just don't remember what the name of the uh, the action is. Um, and so, giving people the ability to work with the overlay in sort of like a Web two point five ish environment, right? Like you know, Web three is the back end; it carries all the information, and then you interact with a you know sort of a, a client side platform to decide what's displayed, and then you can point people to that page. I think is a really powerful framework. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about how you think the um, you you mentioned there could be algorithmic uh, creators, there could be personal curation. Do you think like reputation in Web three should be uh, open sourced? Like, should how? Maybe my question is, when you start coming up with these different reputation points, is there a problem with it being controlled by organizations versus mm -hmm. allowing anyone to create any reputation piece? And I ask that because if anyone can start creating uh, pieces of like reputation or identity that you can associate with yourself, your, your Web3 identity, does it lose value if that crea creating organization doesn't have credibility or starts giving out maybe uh, reputations that are in NFT that are associated with permanence on the blockchain that you know don't actually lead to 
they don't pro they don't provide extra context or clarity around like one person's identity, right? So, yeah. whereas we know a, a business to a degree from a reputable college means something, um, and if anyone could get that degree, it wouldn't mean as much, right? Mm -hmm. Well, to be clear, if anyone could get that degree, so long as the content of the degree was actually absorbed by the the student, it would, right? So the so reputation is not implicit, you know, sort of intrinsically, you know, about or it's not always intrinsically about scarcity. Sometimes it is, right? Like being, you know, sort of the the earliest, you know, person to you know listen to some musical artist or something, and you know, probably that that is about scarcity. It's it's like you were the first. Um, but lots of things like you know degrees from from schools um, aren't intrinsically about scarcity. They're about you know what owning the degree sort of indicates about the education you've received. And so if there were a way to make you know a, a university ten times as efficient in training students, um, you know getting ten times as many students with the same degree wouldn't devalue the degree if it was understood that there had been no sort of reduction in, in the educational quality. Um, so so these are different you know but but both very present sort of circumstances around reputation and, and even to understand which one is relevant at a given moment, as you said, relies on context. Um, and so one could imagine, and particularly with Web3 being fully open and public, that there's uh, you know, lots of spam reputation that, that doesn't really aid, the, that doesn't provide any meaningful context. Um, and indeed, I mean, we sort of have that, right? You know, influencers get tons and tons of you know, junk airdrops all the time. And that's a form of reputation, right? Like it's, you know, people are, are attempting to give their own project reputation by associating it with an influencer. But the influencer, you know, goes in the influencer's hidden folder or whatever, you know, they don't see it. Um, you know, the, the public doesn't see its association with the influencer. Um, you know, yes, it's on chain, but nobody ascribes sort of valuable, meaningful context to that sort of, you know, sort of signal. Um, even though like, you know, it's there. Uh, and so, I think there's going to be sort of a powerful market. I say that you're not like a financial market necessarily, but market in the sense of, you know, there'll, there'll be incentives to produce valuable signals, right? There'll be a sort of like market and reputation design. People will try and produce signals that are meaningful. Uh, and then some will turn out to be meaningful as, as sort of determined by prospective users and, and platforms that might engage with them. And they'll just find themselves in use. Uh, and and yeah. though you know which signals are valuable might change over time too. I mean, like um, there was this old thing called the like clout score, K L O U T, that was like an aggregate of your Twitter activity and maybe some other stuff. Um, that for a while, my understanding is like hotels were like tracking this, and when people with high clout K L O U T showed up at the hotel, they might get free upgrades in hopes that they would talk about it on Twitter. And this eventually like tanked, right? It was sort of like a you know a, a fad. It was aggregating data in ways that I think people found concerning. Uh, and, you know, as a result, it was sort of a, a reputation signal for a short period of time, but then eventually lost signal value. Yeah, so much that that's a really interesting point right there, because your reputation at a given point can have value now and be less valuable later. Like are the things we attribute as meaningful or valuable, worthwhile change over time. And so... Mm -hmm. You know, where you, you use the word permanence a couple of times as we've talked about like reputation and okay, you get some you get some permanent uh, association with your digital identity and how does that how does that tr translate to benefits to you now? Is that going to be beneficial to you later? Is it just going to be meaningless? Is it going to be detrimental? Um, and then you also bring up this the, this clout example. I wanted to ask like, how does one's reputation history unlock new opportunities, whether it's for users, for creators, for third-party apps. I have a quote here from one of the articles you wrote, and I just want to share it real quick. You said, or you wrote, reputation systems present an opportunity for platforms to recognize and thus incentivize participants' high-quality contributions, including content creation, moderation, community building, and gameplay. So I think it's really interesting now how you start taking it to the next level. Okay, you've associated certain pieces of reputation to your Web3 identity that you can carry with you everywhere. Now, what does that unlock? Um, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, great. So the applications are are manifold. And, and again, I'm, I'm wary of being a little too skeuomorphic because like we might, you know, there will be lots of them we can't imagine or haven't rather imagined yet. Um, but 
for example, you know, there are simple ones that are very direct. You know, there are already DAOs that are, you know, recruiting people in to like collaborate on their projects as a function of the sort of the the activities and and you know they've you know they've undertaken on chain and the attestations that they've received from sort of other on chain projects, all of which are stored sort of as as part of their on chain identity. Um, and so one thing is you can like use this information to decide who you might want to work with in in a way that is you know potentially very efficient, right? Could be done algorithmically uh, rather than through sort of a first stage, you know, uh, resume screen or something. You can, you know, search for people with specific types of experience and, and you know, if you want, I guess you could even reach out to them on chain. Um, so there are things that are to look like existing receptacles of reputation, uh, your, your, sorry, rather applications of the receptacles of reputation just like done in on-chain fashions. So, so that's one category. Um, Another is that, you know, I've mentioned a couple times this idea of like being first or being early, right? We tend to ascribe, you know, status to people who are good at spotting trends or noticing interesting artists or, or creators. Um, but it's actually very difficult to prove that you are good at that in, in a sort of pre-Web3 environment. Uh, Whereas now it's actually very easy, right? All you have to do is have, have owned the thing a long time ago, even if you no longer own it today, right? You can show that you owned it on day zero or, or day zero plus epsilon, I guess, you know, right past, uh, you know, sort of the, the initial launch. Um, mm -hmm. And so we can start to establish, and this is, again, an idea sort of that very much my, my co-author and you know, Jod is like really, really into, like we can start to establish reputations as curators as as you know experts in identifying things that are interesting or high quality um that's i think more quantitative and concrete than just sort of like being a tastemaker or an influencer um but then i mean there's there's and then, by the way there's also very mundane forms right it's like you know uh i'm a member of the chain runners nft community and you know other projects that are sort of share a lot of values and, and sort of context with the chain runners, like sometimes give, you know, holders of chain runner NFTs early access to their project or something of the sort. That's again, that's a very like, you know, simple and direct use of a reputation, right? Like you, you have this asset, it, it shows that you're part of a community and, and symbolizes having some specific set of interests and, and, and potentially values. And, and that means that other people want to bring you into their project as well. Yeah. Um, but we'll also see things I think that are that are much like all of these applications are basically just like implementations of things that that existed historically. Um, I think we're going to see more than that because, in the same way that when Facebook started letting people upload photos and like you know sort of curate the stories of their you know sort of their experience, um, people are going to curate more complete identities of themselves you know, on, on chain and, and in their wallets. And that's going to be useful for all sorts of stuff, right? That's going to like, you know, help people like find friends with, with similar interests. It's going to help, um, you know, if you're going to an event, maybe it'll help sort of the event organizers figure out who they should seat you with. Um, and similarly, like at some level, it will help people understand others better um right like you know think about the you know i i frequently talk to students you know i was i was a student who was really excited about math and science research and you know as, as early as as high school um and one of my sort of like big service things these days is i spend a lot of time trying to you know help encourage students who similarly are you know sort of are very excited about doing math and science research very early um you know i work with the Center for Excellence in Education, which runs a summer program called the Research Science Institute that I attended. And then I'm also on the National Leadership Council of Society for Science. Um, and, you know, it's funny, right? Like when I was a high schooler thinking about research, it was actually very difficult to figure out like how one did that. And the way you do it is you, the way you figured that out was you went and talked to, you know, some people who had done it who were older and said, like, how did you get started? Like, you know, what do you do? And, and you know, you look for web resources, you aggregated what you could. Um, you know, even by now, 
there's a much more robust path, right? Like sort of, you know, there are, there are organized, you know, there, there are many more organized summer programs and online resources, and you can watch online lectures to learn stuff that, that didn't really exist. I mean, like, you know, sort of online video was, was kind of a new thing when I was in high school, surreal as that feels to say. Um, but like, even more, right? Like you're, you're still pattern matching, right? You're still looking for people who had the same path, the same sets of interests and sort of asking how did they do it? And, and the possibility of on chain identity, I think creates an even more direct and, and concrete and complete way for people to pattern match around all sorts of experience. It doesn't have to be high school science research. It can be like Taylor Swift fandom, whatever. Totally. Yeah. No, the, I, I do think that curation elements interesting and we're we're yet to see some of that like curation and searchability start taking place but yeah. uh how yeah how people build that that digital identity and paint the picture of themselves so that other people can connect and and find them is is going to be a super cool thing to see happen and now we t we're talking a lot about on-chain identity and i definitely don't want to end this pod before talking about off-chain data that we associate yeah. with our uh, our Web3 identity too. And so, you know, another quote I have, I, I mean, I, I really, I read all your articles, I, I really liked them and you talked about how Thanks. we need an on-ramp for people to record experiences and identity on-chain and like, yeah. and thinking through that. And then in a, a podcast I had a few weeks ago uh, with um, an, an investor, we talked about how he thought crypto is or he thought identity is crypto's biggest problem and how like when you interact on chain you're just an address and that address provides very low dimensional data and lots of applications are gated on having a robust notion of identity and use an example of credit so like you can't have credit without having identity because if we don't know who you are there's no way to have repercussions or um, negative consequences for not paying uh, debt right so like for for on-chain credit to exist, you need on-chain identity. And I'm kind of curious to hear from you, are there other elements or, of identity or reputation that you think we need to get off-chain information and start associating with our, our Web3 identities for? I mean, for me, the easy, the ones that I see a lot seen on like Twitter or heard on podcasts or we talk about credit, KYC, um, I've talked about like, mortgage applications a few times with uh, some other podcast guests, but how do you see that on-ramp of off-chain data really yeah. integrating with these reputation and identity layers we're talking about with Web3? It's a great question. And again, we're, we're only at the, at the sort of the beginnings of this from an innovation perspective. Um, but it, as you say, it's super important, right? There's tons of information that's central to our identity you know, not just our, our legal identity, like, you know, your, your name or whatever, but, but also, you know, our, our personal identities that, you know, has no natural way to store on chain at the moment. Um, you know, some of that, like, you know, some simple things are happening already, right? If you're like a really big fan of a musical artist or a particular streetwear brand, like, you know, those, those NFTs are, are coming to be, right? So like there are, there are like imprints of that fandom that are starting to exist, you know, already. Similarly, um, you know, MIT has been doing NFT diplomas for a number of years these days, uh, all, you know, sort of already. Um, but like, you know, certifications of degrees or specific technical skills, right? Like, you know, I talk about DAOs recruiting people based on their sort of on-chain activity, but like most of the information, you know, you need when you want to like hire somebody is not currently in any meaningful way, like sort of on-chain, right? You're not, you're, you, 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 you might have an initial conversation because they're, uh, you know, they're, they're in an NFT community with you, but like, you know, whether you hire them or not depends on their software engineering skill. Um, the, um, and so figuring out like what the right way, and as you say, in like a low dimensional, like sort of like you know, projected way to sort of encode that information, I think is a super interesting question. Um, and like, you know, there are questions of whether it should be like a straight data upload, right? Like should some entity just like certify, like you have worked at this firm, like, you know, now that lives on chain or should it be some sort of like more web three based, you know, system, like, you know, sort of some people, individuals certify this person has worked at this firm, you know, I saw it on their website and people gain reputation for having certified, you know, made the certifications correctly. And so you sort of have like a, like an internal credit system um, that incentivizes people to like do the research and try and, and vet the different information. 
No idea. Great, great questions. And, and if you're, yeah. if you're building any such product, I'd love to, love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, yeah. No, there's, there's so many, I think there's so many data points. Um, I, I'm I'm in this NFT domain world thinking about like how is that domain your digital identity and and at Unstoppable I just know we're having like tons of conversations. We just uh, one of our uh, engineers today just posted something on Twitter just before this pod that I thought was cool is like basically using your NFT domain as a I, I may I may be talking about this with not the fully accurate terms like using your domain as a email and so you have, it's like a mask for your personal email. So if my personal email is josh at gmail.com, uh, instead I can use my domain like uh, josh.nft and, and you can send emails to that and it routes nice. it to my personal email. And so Slick. this is this maybe isn't a reputation component, but I think it's an interesting way where you've associated your off-chain data, like my, my personal email address, I've associated it with my on-chain identity, my NFT domain, and yep. I can keep some of my personal data hidden, but still have my identity accessible. And having some of these reputation components start entering the the field, whether it's college degree or work history or any like any kind of reputation. I think once you start associating more of those data points, it creates pretty novel ways of interacting with people online in a, a decentralized and sometimes if you choose to be a, a private way too. Yeah, super cool. Um, well, Scott, let's, uh, let's get to our one, two web three section. Uh, I appreciate the oh. conversation we've had about web uh, reputation identity before we started this pod. You, you, we were talking about how there was no way we were going to get through all the questions I had for you today in an hour. And that was certainly the case, but you <laughs> provided some good context and Hey, well, maybe we'll have to do a part two one day, but Love I it. got three questions for you. Uh, the first one being who's an influential web three creator, entrepreneur, collector that's inspired or uh, educated you in crypto and web three. Oh, cool. Okay. So I'm, I'm always terrible at this, like pick one. So I'm going to pick two for this one, uh, but I'll, I'll describe them very quickly. Uh, one is, uh, my, my friend and collaborator far, who is a digital artist who really like introduced me to the world of, of NFTs and, and more broadly, like sort of, you know, metaverse ready crypto and like, He's the person, you know, I've learned tons from him about, you know, sort of how this world works, but, but the deepest insight, I think, is his conception of the metaverse, which is that the metaverse is the digital space that we are like co-creating around ourselves and that we've always been doing that, you know, or, or since there was digital technology, we've been doing that, but like now it's becoming more physical than ever before. Uh, and then the other, you know, I have to give a shout out to Bobby Hundreds. Um, first of all, his book, This Is Not a T-Shirt, is... I think like the, the single best work on brand as community that, that like, you know, that, that could be written much less that, that has been written to date, but like, you know, it's, it's, it's the pinnacle of the set of possible works. Um, it, the guy is just an absolute genius in understanding how communities, you know, sort of create value together through, you know, sort of through their like mutual cohesion and engagement. Um, and how that can, you know, sort of be a, a more powerful, like sort of living brand than any sort of like individual, like artist or, or creator could build on their own. Um, and I, and that's been so core to my understanding of like how agreement about like value and community in, in, in crypto takes place. Nice. Yeah. I'm a, I'm an Adam bomb squad holder myself. I, uh, I, that was a project I got some friends into NFTs for the first time into some a big supporter and I w I wore my NFTs are a scam t shirt that uh, Bobby put together and, and they yes. they gave out through the Adam uh, Bomb Squad community and I wore it to NFT NYC a few weeks ago and I ended up in so many YouTube videos I I got tagged in like three YouTube videos so far from friends like hey that's you because I <laughs> I was just getting stopped left and right for like interview questions on the street. So that was kind That's of That's amazing. Um, I should I should yeah, disclose, no. I, I also own a couple of Adam Bomb Squad NFTs. And then I should also just put in a plug, Bobby Hundreds has a new book coming out, I think tentatively titled NFTs are a scam. So so people yeah. should check that out too. <laughs> this is For not sure. a paid placement. <laughs> I'm just excited about the book. No, just, just supporters. Um, <laughs> second question, what's your favorite NFT? Oh gosh, okay, this is also totally impossible to, to uniquely identify, but but I'll go three. So 
Uh, you said it was one, two, three, right? This we're doing two, three. I promise I'll link you. I got the three next questions, one. but you can give three answers to each question too. That's fine. <laughs> no, no, I give two to the first one. I'll give three to the second one, and one to the third. Uh, you know, even not knowing what the okay. third one is. So, uh, you know, three, three NFTs that are just like incredibly near and dear to my heart. You know, one of them has to be my my sup duck, or my, you know, my, my like you know the to the extent that I have a you know a PFP, I, I use that that duck as my my Twitter header, uh, and then uh, you know sort of. Another one is, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's like very like, you know, personal somehow. It, you know, I'm, I'm an advisor to and, and collaborator with the Thingdoms team. And, uh, you know, I have this, this thing wearing a, you know, a crimson sweater, uh, which is a, you know, a, an accidental trait, but that, that really like spoke to me the second I saw it, just a, a per, you know, a mere, bleh, emerge and appear is what I was trying to say. Emerge or appear, you know, whichever, pick your favorite word. You know, the second I saw it emerge from the, from the randomization, it just like, you know, really, really spoke to me. And this one in particular has like my expression when I'm like a little bit confused by some idea that I'm trying to process, uh, you know, my right. like thinking look. Uh, and then third, um, I mentioned the chain runners community earlier. Um, a lot of my like, you know, really, really close friends in the crypto space have come out of you know, sup ducks and, and thingdoms and, and chain runners. Um, and, you know, my, uh, you know, when, with their, with their newest, uh, sort of XR series, I was able to obtain, uh, you know, one that is a, a character who's sort of like a, you know, a, a, a riddle master. Uh, and so I'm, I'm building my, you know, I write a lot of puzzles and I'm building my first ever like NFT character around this puzzle master. So, so watch out for the riddle master of Mega City. Awesome. No, love those answers. And then my third question is, in five years, what's the craziest thing you think we'll be doing in the metaverse that people just aren't thinking about yet? I mean, that is a completely impossible question because if I can think of it right now, it is, it is not like, like, if I can think of it right now and it's going to happen in the metaverse, we'll have it within the next three years, right? Like, um, mm. I guess the wildest thing I think people will be doing in the metaverse in five years is not thinking of it as if it's a different space. I think the experience of the metaverse will be sort of like pretty seamlessly integrated with all the other things we do sort of digitally um, and, and somewhat integrated even with, with sort of the, the physical world. And so we won't think of it as, you know, sort of a, a fundamentally different space in the same way that like your, your Instagram feed or your Facebook feed, you know, sort of these are like you, you engage with these things as part of your day to day, like just like, you know, life and consumption experience and, you know, assuming you're, you're as, uh, you know, sort of, uh, locked into them as, as, as I unfortunately am. Um, yeah. Similarly, I think like, our day-to-day -day experiences are just going to involve like some amount of engagement in the metaverse and like passing in and out of it will be like opening and closing a browser tab rather than like, you know, transitioning in space. Yeah, no, good, good, good answers. And I, I just want to throw a really quick fourth question out to you um, just because- I hope you, I don't have to give four answers. Are, Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> you are, it's because you, um, because you are a professor at Harvard, at business school, and I, I think that you're interacting with a really interesting community there. And I'm curious, are you feeling a lot of energy from the students that you're, you're around, engaging with, working with, uh, around crypto and Web3? You know, are they oh, sure. buying into this like, next cycle of innovation and technology as much as some people online are? Absolutely. Look, we have a, you know, HBS has a huge crypto blockchain web three club. You know, they, they have a discord, like, you know, I am, I have the coveted role of professor in the, uh, you know, like the, the professor discord role, which is, I think like the coolest discord role I have across all discords. Um, nice. the, uh, you know, there's a, a super active community, you know, HBS has a huge entrepreneurship community in general. And the, the web three crypto segment is very large. Um, and they're really, really sharp, super high energy and more broadly across Harvard. I mean, like, um, you know, there's, there's a, there's an undergraduate blockchain club as well that like they build really serious applications. Like it's, it's a really, really serious group. Um, and indeed, like, you know, I constantly, you know, the, the real measurement for me as a professor, right? Like, is, is this group like, you know, really, really like serious? It's I'm constantly learning stuff from them. 
right? Like, you know, I was talking with, you know, I was talking with one of our, our incoming, you know, Web3 focused students yesterday afternoon and like, oh my gosh, like I walked away with like 10 different things I had to read immediately. Like, I mean, like, like these people are so plugged in and like really, really like, you know, going at it. It's, it's so high energy that like I'm constantly learning just to, you know, from interacting with them and just to keep up. That's awesome. Yeah, we mean, at, coming off a conversation about reputation, you know, Harvard has a reputation for being like a, a top notch educational institute, right? So I, I like hearing that people associated with that reputation are also finding Web3 and crypto in intellectually stimulating, you know, technology and are excited to build in it, right? So thanks for sharing that with us. Um, and then to wrap this up, Scott, could you let people know where to find you, connect with you online after they sure. listen to the episode? Awesome. Uh, well, if you made it this far, thanks so much for listening. Um, and I'd love to connect more. Uh, easiest is at Twitter, at S Commoners, uh, S-K-O-M-I-N-E-R-S. And then also, you know, my website is scottcom.com and I've got tons more contact information there. Beautiful. Well, Scott, thank you so much for joining the Unstoppable Podcast. I learned something. I'm walking away feeling energized, and it's got me thinking more about identity and reputation myself. Everyone, thank you for listening to this episode. Please be sure to leave us a follow, like, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Hello. We appreciate you there. And uh, if you're listening on one of the podcast streaming platforms, leaving a review always helps. So with that, I'll see you in the metaverse. We'll talk to you next week. Peace out. QED. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Unstoppable Podcast. If something we said today resonated with you, please subscribe, leave us a review, and share this with your friends. And remember, this conversation doesn't have to end here. Tweet us your thoughts, ideas, or questions at Unstoppable Web. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week.